So very first story, President Stanley Adwe Kufuado, Nana Adodankwe Kufuado and his cabinet have started a three-day retreat. It is to take a look at the impact of the implications of the coronavirus pandemic across all governance sectors in the country. Now the retreat was announced at a Ministry of Information press conference in Accra. Government has rolled out a number of measures in responding to the health crisis and its attendant socioeconomic challenges that has come with its management. These measures included the free water supply for three months and the free electricity for three months for lifeline consumers and 50% discount for non-lifeline consumers, among several others. Eight weeks into the pandemic, and the finance minister says Ghana has gathered substantial data on the real impact of the COVID-19 across various sectors, including education, health, economy, trade, the legal front, amongst others. Now, joining us via Skype is Professor John Gachi of the University of, of Cape Coast to share some light on this. Prof, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Right, so how important or crucial is this cabinet retreat? Well, I think uh, uh, it's important because it's required by law. Uh, if you go to the Public Financial Management Act, it is required that uh, by the close of May, the government is required to provide certain updates regarding uh, what they call fiscal strategy document. Mm. And within that fiscal strategy document, the government is required to provide a progress report about the management of the economy in the previous, provide updates regarding revenue mobilization, uh, update regarding the wage a bill to revenue, tax revenue, update regarding public debt to GDP, update regarding um, uh, other uh, micro fiscal indicators. Right. And in that requirement, the government is supposed to provide reasons for the deviations and uh, the risk to the economy going forward. Right. So I believe that is exactly what the government is, do is, is doing currently as you are now. Mm. Let's look at the composition of this retreat. Should it be experts on the economy? Or sh who, who should make up this retreat? That is supposed to be the work of cabinet. Uh, because uh, this is the job done by the finance ministry and submitting it to cabinet to, to look at. Mm. and formulate what they call the fiscal uh, strategy document. So it's a cabinet retreat. And that is the provision in Section 17 of the Public Financial Management Act. And the direction of this retreat should be what? Looking at the, which aspect of the economy should, should be the focal, focal areas? It is the entire economy translated into what we call the macro fiscal framework. And right. that macro fiscal right. framework can be uh, decomposed into revenue. Right. So right. over there, we may be looking at wage bill. Uh, that is expenditure side as a, as a percentage of uh, tax revenue. Mm. Uh, we will also be looking at the public debt as a percentage of the size of the economy. We'll be looking at the previous year's uh, indicators provided in these areas and look at the deviation then it is the duty of the finance minister to provide reasons for the deviation, and those things should be translated into a new uh, fiscal strategy document that will run the economy for the next three to five years. Right. So that right. is the requirement. Mm. It is only coincidental that we have a COVID-19, that we have taken some measures, and that will be added to what uh, is required by the Public Financial Management Act for them to do. Interesting you mentioned the finance minister. Now, I, I know you, you recall that he mentioned that it would take at least three years, three years to revive the economy. What do you make of it? And do you think 
uh, that's a difficult task? Well, generally, it's, it's a difficult task, but uh, we can also appreciate the fact that because of uncertainty surrounding the COVID-19, uh, issues will be unfolding. So we, may, we, we should not be surprised if it comes out today and say that upon reflection and collecting more data, I think that the economy will come back on track in two years or five years. Right. So the right. whole thing depends on the development of new issues uh, as it comes to the attention of the finance minister and the, and, and, and the government. Mm. But he should be in position to provide reason and data, especially as uh, data issues have become very important uh, in terms of managing the COVID-19 itself and in terms of uh, the macro fiscal data that we have been presenting in the past three years and uh, what we have presented to IMF and how Ghanaians are actually questioning the credibility of, of data. So whatever is going to say, whether it's going to maintain the three years, reduce it or uh, uh, extend it, should be predicated on uh, solid, credible data. Right. Prof, nobody anticipated COVID-19 and its effect on the economy. What lessons can be learned whilst, you know, we reshape the economy as a result of COVID-19? Two lessons. First one is that as managers of the economy, we should appreciate the fact that there is, called, there is something called external shocks, which you may not, you may not anticipate. Right. And uh, we also need to accept the fact that those things have been provided for in our constitution and in our public financial management framework that we should trigger. But the greater lesson is that in order to trigger those provisions in our laws to manage unanticipated uh, uh, development like COVID-19, etc., we need to build buffers for the economy, fiscal and monetary buffers for the economy, infrastructure buffer for the economy, so that when they do okay, we will be in position to readily uh, respond to those uh, uh, external development, be it natural disaster, be it health pandemic, et cetera. So now we need to focus on building buffers for the economy, right. fiscal buffer, right. monetary buffer, institutional buffer, and infrastructure. Mm. Prof, thank you so much for that clarity, Professor. John Gachi is with the University of Cape Coast. Now, all ministers of state have been directed to present a report on their respective sectors in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic to the president at a three-day retreat. Eight weeks since the country was struck by the coronavirus pandemic, the three-day cabinet retreat would enable government to decide on its next action. Information Minister Kojo Opon Nkrumah said recommendations would be noted and inputs made in the mid-year budget review. The President and his Cabinet are in the next coming days going to commence an exercise to examine the actual impact beyond what was projected. You recall initially there was a projection. Eight weeks on, there's more data now on what the actual impact is and what it takes to recover as an economy from it. The Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research into Medicine has so far tested over 40,000 samples for COVID-19. A backlog of over 1,000 is expected to be cleared this week. Our reporter, William Evans Inkum, is stationed at KCCR and joins us live for an update. Hello, William. Thanks for joining us. Hello, Miriam. Thanks for having me. Right. So what can you report for us from KCCR? All right, Miriam. So... As you can see, just inside this particular lab is the biosafety level three, and this is where samples are brought. That is where the first, uh, this is the first step of the uh, process. Now, what is happening here is that, yes, they've been able to clear the backlog, but only yesterday, some 1,000 cases were brought here. Right, that's a- uh, Spending uh, sleepless night uh, testing the, 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 the samples and all of that. But let me engage uh, a virologist, uh, Dr. Michael Ousu,
who has been here, I mean, very working tirelessly to ensure that uh, results are produced in real time. So, Doc, uh, I know you are doing a lot of work, but we are told that we've reached our peak. What does it mean to you? Well, so from my understanding, if you say you have reached your peak, it means that you have reached a point where you have uh, the new cases that you get in a country is almost remaining constant and will begin to fall. This is what reaching a peak means. So uh, I, I want to understand that the statement was a caution to Ghanaians that uh, we should be careful if we don't take measures in place, we are likely to have increased number of cases. But I think that more samples are coming, more testing is being done, and we need to understand every day how many new cases we get across the entire country. If you realize that the number of new cases we get is almost buffering, it's almost becoming constant, and the rate begins to fall down, then we can talk about reaching a peak and therefore beginning to decline. I think that uh, we need more and more data across the entire country. We need to analyze this data on a daily basis. We need to understand how the virus is moving through the population. It is only after this that we can tell. I think it's a bit too early uh, to say we have reached our people. The evidence of the data is very weak, and we may not be able to make these projections uh, as of now. Mm. Uh, not too long ago, a sample was brought from Confanochi Teaching Hospital, and you even told me not too long ago that only yesterday, between 6 and p.m., uh, 6 p.m. and 7 p.m., you received over 1,000 uh, coming from the other regions. When you juxtapose that to the, the, the claim by the Director General of Health Service that we've reached our peak, will you say that we haven't, looking at what you are getting at the moment? Well, as I said once again, I believe the Director General made this statement. He was trying to caution Ghanaians that based on what they have seen, the numbers are going up. So we should be able to adhere to all the precautions. But as I said, if we have we have backlogs, we have cleared all the backlogs, but just yesterday night we have a thousand two cases coming from different regions in Ashanti, in Bono and other places. And as we test, we keep getting more and more positive. So it is possible in the next one or two weeks you could have increase in if you observe the trend, not only for us in Greater Accra and everywhere, I'm beginning to see how the trend will go before you can clearly say that you have reached up. If you reach your peak, what it means is that the virus has run th significantly through the population, and therefore new people, new cases are not coming, and people who have had it are recovering. So you can relax your measures and tell people to go about their normal duties. But I think that the data general was trying to caution people that we should stick to the measures, we should adhere to the measures, we should make sure that we observe all the protocols so that we don't get to a point where the cases will spike out of control. But as I said, you have to understand the data. You need to know what is happening before we can say that. And so far as cases are coming and testing is ongoing and more positives are beginning to be recorded, uh, we, we, we're too early for us to say. So I think the evidence of that is, is weak. And we need to get more accumulated data across different parts of Ghana before we'll be able to uh, say that we have reached a point where we think that many people are infected and therefore we are beginning to go down uh, and the risk is beginning to fall uh, down. All right, thank you very much. So, Miriam, we, we, we have gone through the process. Uh, we've uh, moved through about three laboratories. It's a long process, I mean, um, for a case or for a sample to be tested and proven uh, positive or otherwise. It's a, it's a long process, and I can tell you that a, a case will last more than a two hours, sometimes between two and six hours before a result can be produced. Because over here, they're using the polymerase chain reaction as a PCR. Um, so it's a bit, that particular method is a bit slower uh, when you are testing. And sometimes um, it, they, they take about 48 hours on a sample. So that is the reality here at the KCCR, Miriam. All right, William Evanson Koum, thank you very much. He was reporting from KCCR in Kumasi. Still staying with COVID related, um, awaiting the result of a COVID 19 test, according to persons who have gone through it, is traumatizing. But those who test negative argue their situation is worse due to the seeming neglect by the health authorities following the long delay in communicating their test results to them. Grace Amwasari has the rest of the story. In testing for COVID-19, the spotlight is on those who test positive.
Nathaniel Nunu tested negative for COVID-19, but tells me the period before hearing from the health service was agonizing. It was running through my mind, Madam, it's not easy. Am I going to come back? I know for sure I'll come back. Well, am I going to come back alive? Are they going to take me to hospital or whatnot in case it proves uh, positive? Others never heard from the health authorities. So after the guy took the sample, he told me that the result will be ready between four and seven days. And, you know, seven days elapsed. Another week came, two weeks, and I was like, so what is going on? So in, in, in my head, I was like, is it that I'm positive? What, why are they dragging your feet? Why is the resort not in? I just got some few you know, health, health practitioners and they were like, when it's negative, they don't get back. So I was like, okay, maybe I'm negative. But then again, I was still like, you know, thinking, what's going on? What's going on? But the Ghana Health Service has blamed the setback on the multiple testing. I think there have been some initial challenges of uh, relaying information back to them. The initial surge was the fact that Positive was the main case, so I can assure that anybody who is positive has been looked for. It is possible that those who are not negative are the ones that probably we don't make strong efforts to reach them. Virologist Eugene Arthur says the delay cannot be blamed on the behavior of the virus, as argued by others. A psychologist, Dr. Joan Afutu, says the delay does not augur well for those whose samples have been taken. I would say it's anxiety provoking. There are a lot of uh, implications to this. Mm. Once I've taken a test, I am expecting that I will receive a result. Yeah. And so if the result is not coming, then the, the, the person becomes even more worried. If it's on the positive, I also want to know whether I am negative or positive. Mm. According to her, counseling for people whose samples have been taken is crucial. Our reaction usually is based on whether we, we've had pre-counseling. If you've had pre-counseling, you are a bit calmer because you are told the implications of the result. It's either positive or negative. We don't have any middle ground. But if there is no pre-counseling before the testing, then the person has to, to go with the information he or she has about COVID. So you hear that once you get it, you are going to that. You've seen these visuals. And that is informing how you are feeling. Mm. Of course, you'd agree that that waiting time can be traumatizing. But the minority in parliament has urged governments to stop giving false hope so that the coronavirus is being contained. The minority leader, Haruna Idrusu, addressing the media in parliament, says government is not being forthright on the figures on the infection. A report by Kumla Kluche. As a minority, the sharp rise in the number of cases reported by authorities in the last two weeks is deeply worrying. And therefore, the attempt to downplay this fact is unacceptable to us in the exercise of our oversight. If you could lock down when the numbers were less than 300, and then when you have numbers up to 3,000, you certainly must be in a dilemma. And I don't admire the dilemma and quagma of President Nanadu Dankwa and his team, which is fighting the menace. Government at a media briefing indicated that the country is getting to its peak on the COVID-19 cases, but these claims have been challenged. Government should desist from selling false hope of a situation under control and using its management of information as a cover for this farce. That ensures the intelligence of Ghanaians when we are 3,000 and you say that we should wait, all is well. All was not well when even we were at 200 or 300. How can it be well at 3,000 and counting? The minority maintains that the country is still in a precarious situation. What President Akufuado and his government must understand is that this is certainly above a public relations uh, gimmick. This is not a matter for persons to be egoistic or people to feel very high when they are addressing the nation in this uh, matter. He should consider it but a fatal national emergency of a crisis threatened by novel coronavirus. 
Haruna Idrisu, served notice the minority will demand for an audit of the funds allocated to the COVID-19 pandemic fight. So shorten the period, multiply 2 million by the number of days of the lockdown, and we demand accountability for the rest of the money. No wonder we are hearing reports that PPEs are now being stolen. Who gives what to who, at what time, and who is accountable? We will not hesitate in demanding an audit into all expenditure related to COVID-19, whether the money came from internal sources or from the World Bank IMF uh, sources. Well, meanwhile, Deputy Information Minister Pius Hajide has described comments by the NDC on efforts taken by government so far in the fight against coronavirus as a deliberate and pathetic attempt to downplay government's efforts reacting to some assertions by the minority on the IMF loan support for Guinean foreign students. The Deputy Information Minister said government has paid all monthly stipends of foreign students upfront. Sarah Paku is at the Ministry of Information and joins us. Hello, Sarah. Good afternoon. Hello, Sarah, if you can hear me. Hello, Sarah. Hello, I can hear you. Right. Thanks for joining us. So um, what is the Deputy Minister's response, um, you know, to, 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 to what the Haruna Idrisu have said so far? Well, the Deputy Minister says all that the minority uh, leaders in Parliament spoke about yesterday at their press briefing is a deliberate attempt to downplay all efforts by government, like you rightly said. He mm. said most of the information they put across were distorted and um, uh, they did not understand why government has invited them on several locations to come and uh, put, make input to its efforts to fight the pandemic in the country, but they refused to attend, yet they hold press briefings and Facebook live uh, meetings to um, throw dust in the eyes of the public. That's the word he used. Um, he actually said that government... Um, is greatly sensitive to the plight of Ghanaians, and there is no way they would take any decision that would go uh, against the health of any Ghanaian. He reacted to the fact that the minority said some uh, figures about the IMF fund and interest rates. He said right. that was false. He also said concerns raised about the foreign students that government has neglected. In fact, government has paid in a real um, monthly stipend of foreign students up front. So there is no way any foreign student can complain of any neglect by government. He also said that there are a lot of um, recommendations or requests on the table of government for G Ghanaian nationalities who are in foreign countries to be brought back home just as other nationals are doing for their people. And right. government is considering all this uh, requests that have been brought, but they need to take into consideration expert opinions, expert advice on the risk involved in bringing all those people into the country. So it is not true that government is not seeking expert opinions on its decisions is taken in this fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. Did he throw any light on um, the two million that was used to feed uh, the vulnerable? Did he shed any light on that? Come again, Bella. I was asking if there, there were any details on how the two million was used um, as far as taking care of the vulnerable. Oh, yes. He, he briefly touched on it that um, government has been transparent in all its efforts, all activities that it is taking. And so if anyone has any concerns, you can't walk into their offices and seek clarification. So it is not true that government has not been transparent right. in the disbursement of this fund in the fight against the pandemic. Mm. Sarah, thank you very much for joining us. Sarah Park will join us from the Ministry of Information. But let's go to Tamale, where the Tamale, Pub uh, Tamale Public Health and Reference Laboratory has from April 29 tested some 720 samples of the novel coronavirus. The samples were received from the Northing, Upper East, Upper West, Savannah and Northeast regions. The center until Wednesday, May 6th, 
had no backlogs. It, however, received some 500 samples from the Upper East region. Our correspondent Zubeda Ismail was at the centre and joins us on Skype. Zubeda, what's the situation um, at the Tam Tamale Laboratory Centre now? Um, I must tell you that I was there some um, about an hour ago and then work is ongoing. You would see people um, fully protected in their PPEs and are ready to make sure that the current samples that they have at hand, that is about 600 of them, would be tested. I The word that was used was that it is currently at the analyzing stage. And when they are done analyzing it, that is where they will now um, subject all these samples to the testing. Now, uh, we are talking about something I arrived on Wednesday from the Upper East region, and 100 arrived from Tama, I mean, Northern region, talking about um, all the 16 districts in the current Northern region that we have also arrived by the close of Thursday, that yesterday they received 100 from Northern region. So currently, the center is handling some 600 samples that are getting, I mean, that are being tested. And I spoke with the director of the center, Dr. Abdul Karim Abbas. He told me that latest by close of tomorrow, Saturday, results of these um, 600 samples would be made known to the facilities that brought them to the center. Right. Mm. Do you know if there were any backlogs from the, from the, uh, you know, the initial samples that were taken to the laboratory? Miriam, um, they never had any backlogs because for them, um, according to the director, they have enough staff and they have enough logistics. We are talking about about 30 staff in the center alone. This is um, These are people that are supposed to work on samples, about 30 of them, right. including lab technicians. So they didn't have backlogs as of um, Wednesday until so they received the new uh, samples that are about 600 of them. Mm. Zubeda, thank you very much for joining us. Zubeda was reporting from Tamale, the public health and reference lab, where they have some about 600 samples of COVID-19 to cater for. But the Biosafety Level 3 Laboratory at the Western Region Veterinary Services Department on Monday began testing samples of suspected COVID-19 cases. The laboratory started with 80 samples. Now, results have since started trickling in. We will we'll go live uh, to the Western region where my colleague Eric Yao Ejay is at the laboratory and gives us an update. Right, we're trying to connect with him on Skype, but when, we, when he does join us on Skype, um, we'll, we'll have a conversation about how the center is dealing with about 80 samples that they have to sort out. But the Ghana Health Service says it expects a decline in coronavirus cases. The Director of Public Health at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Bedou Sarkodie, who made this known at the COVID-19 media briefing in Accra, said Ghana has reached its peak of infections. The country has recorded 3,091 cases so far. additional 372 cases with Bono becoming the 13th region to record a case. Director of Public Health at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Bedou Sarkodie explained the assessment module. He expects the public to continue adhering to the preventive measures to contain the spread of the virus. It was a build up till getting to the end of April and then we have been coming down gradually. That is what we meant being picked. This is not saying that Ghana is off the hook yet. The odds are not over and the woes are not off. To sustain this and further calm down, we need to adhere to all the various preventive etiquettes that have been spelled out quite a number of times here. The Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwaji, gave a further breakdown of data on the additional recorded cases. 618 of this number had come from the routine surveillance and as, as much as 2,032 has come from the enhanced contact tracing. The number of people who are moderately ill still remains at five. 33,069 persons have been tested from the routine surveillance, and we have 944, giving it a positivity rate of 2.85%. 102 
1,833 has come from the enhanced contact tracing. And out of the 2,032, as mentioned earlier, had been confirmed, leaving our positivity rate of about 1.9%. The health service assured the public of regular updates on the website. Right now, let's go back to the Western region where my colleague um, Eric Yaweje joins us to give us an update from the Biosafety Level 3 Laboratory. Yeah, okay. Um, we seem to be having some challenge with him, but we will definitely make contact with him. And when we do, he will give us an update on uh, cases at the Biosafety Level 3 Laboratory in the Western Region. This is still Midday Live on TV3. Let's move away from COVID-19 to the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, um, where they are partnering with the World Bank to commence the distribution of 1 million nose marks to the vulnerable across the country. Now, the exercise is to help contain the COVID-19. The wearing of nose masks has become recommended in the prevention of contracting coronavirus. Its wearing has been made mandatory, though not everyone can afford. The Health Minister, Kweku Ajimamenu, at an event to receive support from World Vision, was emphatic government cannot provide nose masks to all Ghanaians, adding the citizens must help themselves. We behave as if if government doesn't bring something for free, we cannot do nothing. But at the end of the day, we all find food to eat. So critical things like this, when it is not coming from heaven, you should also work and force yourself to get them. Now that we have said that whether you should wear face masks or nose masks, whatever word you use, some of us are sitting down for government to bring everything for free. Government has no gold mine, no farm. So where will government get all this money? The one million nose masks, which is partly funded by the World Bank, are being produced by different companies. Thanks for staying with us. We have been able to establish contact with Eric Yao Eje from the Western Region to bring us updates from the Biosafety Level 3 Laboratory. Hello, Eric. Hello, Mariam. Thanks for joining us finally. So what can you report from the 80 samples? Thank you very much. Um... As you rightly said, I am currently at the Biosafety Level 3 lab here at the Western Regional Office of the uh, Veterinary Services Department. And this container you see behind me is the container that is serving as the Biosafety Level 3 lab. And there's another one at the extreme, and that is also Biosafety Level 2. Now, I can report that the first batch of samples, the 80 samples that this lab received, they've, all, they've dispatched all the results and the results are with the Western Region Health Directorate. Now, um, I'm told that since Monday, they've been receiving some samples. So I have with me a, one of the doctors here at the lab for what has been happening since Monday. So um, good afternoon, Dr. Uh, Oliver Dankwa. And welcome to TV3 News. So since Monday, you've been working. Um, you, you told me before we came on air that you been able to finish with the 80 samples, the first batch of samples. Since then, how, how many samples have you received? So samples keep trickling in. And um, after the first 80 that we took delivery of on Monday, we have continued to receive samples. At this point, we've gone past the 300 mark. So we've gone past samples. Just this afternoon, we received um, 100 samples from the public health laboratory. So we are still working on that. Do you have a backlog? We currently don't have any backlog. Okay. These, uh, these samples that you are receiving, where are they coming from? They are coming from the public health lab. Okay. Do we know whether there are other regions that have their samples also? Um, we are coordinating with the public health lab. So if any um, person in the region or any institution in the region or even in Western North or I want to and bring in samples, they will have to contact them and they will know where the samples are. How long does it take you for you to work on a batch? Well, per our current um, workforce, we are able to do um, in about 10 hours from start to finish. So in that period, how many samples are you actually able to work on? About 100 samples. About 100 samples. So in a day, how many samples are you able to work on? 
so we are currently running two shifts. And so um, right now we can do about 200. Okay, okay. we're told that you have the capacity to go beyond um, 200 a day? Yes, we have the capacity to go beyond um, 200 and we can do 300 a day, but um, currently we are doing 200. The samples yes. that we are receiving are not and so we are able to work on now. Okay, so it means that when you ramp up, you have the kick on other samples. Certainly. Certainly. Uh, okay, when we when we saw a gentleman who had wanted to come in to test, yeah. is this something that you allow? No, that's not something we allow. And and thanks for the opportunity so that we use this medium to inform the public that the veterinary laboratory is only a testing facility. We are supporting the government of Ghana and we are collaborating with other health institutions. So, um, if someone is concerned and wants to be tested, they shouldn't work in here. This is not um, a place where we are receiving patients and taking samples from. If they have any concerns, they can contact the public health laboratory at the same Okay. You told me about the fact that you ran two shifts. Um, what is your current staff strength? So, currently, there are 15 people that we are working with, and majority of whom are veterinarians and veterinary technicians. Uh, we also have supporting staff from Quanta, the public health laboratory there. So we have biomedical scientists who have joined us to help us run the samples as soon as possible. Okay, and you think that currently your your manpower is enough? Yes, currently our manpower is enough. Um, like most of the institutions, what we are also currently experiencing, and it's a challenge, is the issue of PPE. Because each time we wear PPE and go inside there, we are supposed to burn it. And so we cannot bring it out, and so we run out quite fast. Um, but some people, some institutions have been generous enough and have um, come to our aid to meet the TPEs and, and other forms of support. And we, we encourage the public to do so if they, they wish. Okay. And anyone who wants to help us in, in, in terms of TPE or in any other kind, we, we are ready to accept. Okay. okay. You are told that there are okay, different right. categories mm. of samples that um, the, the ones that are from... Hello, Eric. We seem to be having... Do you treat all these samples the same? No, we don't treat all the samples the same. Um, if we have right. a case that is positive, uh, comes to our, our lab. Mm. Eric, if, if, to, if you can um, hear me, um, not to interrupt you, but can you also find out how many samples they have received today and if they're able to test all of it by close of today? Okay. So currently we have received 100 samples this morning. And the sorting and pulling team just came out of the BSL3. And the next team, which is the gene extraction, they are inside working on it. This afternoon, we are expecting to receive another 100 from the public health lab. And we are, will be able to finish that um, today. Today as well. Okay, thank you very much. So, Miriam, that is Dr. Dankwa. Right. Giving us a view as to what has been happening since Monday. But I must report that, uh, you know, our first case come, came from a Chinese national. We are told that... The, the results are in, and he has again tested negative. Right, Maybe. right. Eric, thank you so much for the update from the Western region. Still midday live. Hello, good afternoon, and it's time for us to bring you the latest in the world of sports. My name is Thierry Nyan. Now, former Black Stars coach Chris Yapia is making demands for his unpaid salaries and has revealed the situation has intensified, with the GFA's continuing silence on the matter. But the GFA has hit back, insisting it is the duty of the Ministry of Sports to settle salaries of national team coaches. Here's what we know so far. Developing saga, the initial signs don't look good, but one man remains hopeful of reaching the light at the end of the tunnel. Kwesi Apia seeks remittance for his unpaid salary that he claims were between August and December 2019. Apia was at post as Black Stars coach for two years before his contract was terminated by the Ghana Football Association in a massive clearance of the technical setups of the national teams, shortly after the new GFA administration took over. Apia said this is money he has worked for, and the GFA's silence over the matter these past few months is a show of disrespect. He is laying claim to an amount of $185,000 that the GFA also denies being their responsibility. The GFA Communications Director, Henry Asante Chum, also tells TV3 Sports that the unpaid salary is for the Ministry of Youth and Sports to settle. He says although the GFA are employers of the national team coach, it is the state that pays the coach. This is only the beginning of this matter, but a situation that must be resolved with the necessary swiftness 
or another legal battle will threaten to derail any significant progress by the current FA. All right, now Yaya Toure is backing former Ivory Coast teammate Didier Drogba's bid to become president of the Ivorian Football Association. Now, Drogba represented his uh, country 105 times and announced his intention to run for the post back in September. However, due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, no date has been scheduled for the election. The former Ivory Coast captain faces competition from incumbent Sori Diabate and FIF Vice President Idris Diallo. So that'll be all for the sports here on Middle Life with me, Thierry Nyan. Now, let's throw back a bit today um, to the very first season of Talented Kids, where 12 year old Awal Mohammed thrilled Ghanaians in a performance with Sarkodie. It's been exciting performances from contestants and some celebrities throughout the 11 seasons of Talented Kids. One performance that mesmerized viewers was that of Awa Muhammad and Sarkodie. With his dazzling tongue twisting likened to the current reigning artist of the decade and the fastest rapper in Ghana, this would definitely bring back some good old memories. <laughs> No, that was something to smile about, isn't it? Well, the COVID-19 pandemic rages on and Ghanaian rapper and Adam has uh, reached out to health facilities um, to assist them. That's uh, the whole municipality in the Volta region. Those who are requesting assistance. Okay. On Sunday, it's Mother's Day. What are you planning to do for your mom? We have exciting packages available to you on all our platforms. On TV3, we're asking you if uh, your mom has got talent. And if she does, can you record her exhibiting that talent? Maybe she's a great dancer, or maybe she can sing, or she has a talent that can win you something amazing for her on Mother's Day on 3FM 92.7 as well. We have a promotion that allows you to tell the world why your mom is amazing and she could win lunch for herself plus 10 others whilst we observe social distancing. Well, that's it for the news today. There's more news on 3news.com. I'm Miriam Osea-Ajman. Have a great weekend.